All right, part C. Part C, let's conclude the bank war. If you haven't seen part B, you must do it. Big, big, epic event, the bank war in the presidential election of 1832, but it's not over yet. Jackson has, has defeated Clay in the election, and oh, it was an epic election. What an election. Jackson facing off against Henry Clay, against Nicholas Biddle and all of his money, against all of the press that's financed by by Nicholas Biddle, everything just stacking up against the man. It seems almost maybe this maybe this monster is just too big to defeat, but Jackson slays the many-headed monster with his veto message in 1832, and then in the election receives a mandate, a mandate from the American people confirming that they were on board with his program. Jackson wins in a landslide victory in that 1832 election. And we close with this cartoon. Now, if you look closely at the cartoon, you can read right here some text. On, uh, on the little scroll there that Jackson has as he drives the money changers out of the temple. What does the text say? Order for the removal of the public money deposited in the bank in the United States Bank. Hmm. What does that mean? Order for the removal of the public money deposited in the United States Bank. If you've been keeping up with our lectures, you know what that means. You know what that means, because one of the functions of the Bank of the United States was accepting deposits, federal deposits from the government and having them deposited at the bank. What does this have to do with the bank war? Well, the bank charter doesn't run out until 1836. It's 18. 18- 32 going into 1833 jackson says uh <laughs> i can't just have this bank hanging around for another three years i've got to we've, we've got to do something about this this is a dangerous institution especially now because who knows what they'll do to get rechartered to override the will of the people we've got to 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 end this institution uh once and for all, it's too dangerous to still have an existence. We must kill the bank right now, bleed it dry by removing the federal deposits from the Bank of the United States. And so um, this action right here was actually one of the most controversial moves that Jackson took in his presidency on, on this bank issue. Jackson says, this thing cannot be allowed to function any longer. So I'm going to do, I'm going to bleed it dry by removing all the federal money that's been deposited in the Bank of the United States. The people spoke, it's done. It's not going to be rechartered. So let's remove it now. And then we're going to place them in state banks. Many of those state banks were pro-Jackson state banks. They were state chartered banks that supported Jackson. Remember in uh, the part B of the lecture last uh, this uh, last time, we looked at what was the coalition that Jackson built to take down the Bank of the United States. He had hard money, he had free banking, but then he also had these state chartered banks. And so now Jackson wants to remove the federal deposit, place them in state banks. Critics called them pet banks, pet banks, because they're little pets of the of the uh, of the president. And uh, uh, it was a very, very controversial move, even among Jackson's own cabinet. In fact, when Jackson ordered his Treasury Secretary to remove the federal deposits from the Bank of the United States, the Treasury Secretary refused, and so Jackson fired him. Jackson fired him for refusing to remove the deposits. Jackson then attempted to nominate a new Treasury Secretary Roger Taney in the Senate. Um, the Senate rejected his nominee on the basis that he would he would uh, remove the federal deposits. Uh, the Senate also, which was controlled by the Whig Party and Henry Clay, Clay attempted to have the Senate offic- officially censure Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson, in response, called Clay quote reckless and as full of fury as a drunken man in a brothel. <laughs> Uh, again, another classic uh, uh, 
statement from from Andrew Jackson against against Henry Clay. Um, Clay and the Whigs tried everything they could to block this this removal, but eventually uh, uh, Jackson wins out. Um, he had support in the House of Representatives. James K. Polk, who was Speaker of the House, a hard money guy, um, uh, the House of Representatives resolved that they approved of Jackson's move to uh, remove the the uh, deposits. Nicholas Biddle actually um, attempted to intervene in this as well, and and Nicholas Biddle in 1833 and 1844 very abruptly began contracting the bank's operations and con contracting the bank's uh, credit, and. Uh, actually, we know through looking at Biddle's correspondence that this was a purposeful, deliberate move on his part to cause fiscal, uh, possibly a fiscal crisis in order to, to get the public against the removal of these deposits. Um, he was hoping, you know, we'll cause interest rates to spike. That will force Jackson into a compromise. Uh, but the plan actually backfired, and most of the people interpreted this as Biddle, again, intervening in the nation's politics. And it made actually reflected very poorly on Biddle that he had done something like this so deliberately. By the way, there was a, uh, an event in the middle of all of this. Um, Andrew Jackson, in January of 1835, was attending a funeral of a congressman. And there was a man living in Washington, D.C. named Richard Lawrence. And he was a house painter, but at the moment he was unemployed because of the poor economy, in, in, in part because of the contraction of this credit from the Bank of the United States. Well, um, this man, Richard Lawrence, didn't blame Biddle, he blamed Jackson for the removal of the deposits, attended this event, aimed his pistol at Jackson. The pistol misfired. He then took a second pistol, aimed at Jackson again, and that pistol misfired. Jackson, by this point, realizes what's happening, <laughs> ran towards the man with his cane and started and, and attacked him. And of course, uh, the man was man was arrested. Later, after that whole saga, by the way, this was the first um, assassination attempt on a sitting president. Jackson survives it. Uh, afterwards, the pistols were tested. And each time they perform perfectly. Um, many historians uh, attributed, attributed the misfiring to humid weather at the time, but there are many others who said this is this was a providential um, act that the the misfiring and Jackson was was protected. Jackson, for his part, suspected that there was uh, that his political enemies and maybe the bank itself was uh, attempting to take down take down his presidency. Anyway, interesting story there. Uh, that was in January of 1835. Well, Jackson, Jackson succeeds in removing the deposits. The Bank of the United States winds down, winds down its operations. After 1836, it becomes a purely just private corporation, um, a state chartered bank in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia. And then uh, finally in 1841, it liquidated its assets and completely ceased to exist. There was no central bank in the United States from 1836 until 1913. So no central bank at all in the United States from 1836 to 1913. Of course, in 1913 was the year that the Federal Reserve Bank was founded. And there's the Federal Reserve Building in Washington, D.C. And of course, the Federal Reserve today uh, prints our paper currency. Um, on a $1 note, there's a picture of George Washington on the five dollar note, there's a picture of uh, Abraham Lincoln. On the ten dollar note, a picture of uh, uh, Alexander Hamilton. And uh, on a twenty dollar note, there's what was it? What was it? Uh, oh, oh, oh! Wow! Who? What? What? Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson. Right there on the twenty dollar. Federal Reserve No. Hmm. What's that all about? I've always been really, really fascinated by the inclusion of Andrew Jackson on the $20 Federal Reserve note. 
one of the mo- more popular notes in, in our country's economy. Everybody uses 20s, and, and there's Andrew Jackson. That's awfully interesting, isn't it? I can't help but think sometimes that there might not be somewhat of a, a jab in there, a sort of gotcha uh, stick to the man, Andrew Jackson, involved in putting his face on the Federal Reserve note. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they just really like Andrew Jackson and that's why he's on the note. I'm not sure. But isn't that pretty fascinating? Well, actually, beginning, especially in 1835, the economy was booming again and doing quite well. And in that boom, persisted through 1830s into 1836 and actually because of revenue from uh, tariff revenue and in the sale of public lands president jackson succeeded and he was the only president to have ever done this paid off the entire national debt on the first of january 1835 imagine that imagine that that's that's something else huh uh paid off the entire national debt nevertheless uh trouble is brewing in this uh in this early period right after the expiration of the bank of the united states because there is another bubble all right the economy is booming but there's another bubble and this bubble as you may have predicted is in western land western land speculation and what's it fueled by is fueled by the state banks there's no longer a bank in the united states anymore but when the federal government removed its deposits from the bank of the united states into the state chartered banks Many of those state chartered banks were in the, in the West, and there was a, a bit of a transfer of, of funds from East to West, and those state banks used those federal deposits to expand their note issue, and these notes are being used to speculate in the purchase of Western land. Jackson actually saw this coming, and in July of 1836, issued the Specie Circular, this uh, executive order, whereby the federal government would only accept gold and silver coin for Western land purchases. Jackson said, I I see this coming. It doesn't look good. People are speculating on land with paper money. I'm absolutely opposed to this. I'm a hard money guy. We're only going to accept gold and silver coin for Western land purchases. This went into effect in August of 1836. It sounded pretty good on paper, no pun intended, but the, uh, the effect of it actually was to to cause a spike in demand for gold and silver coin because that's all the federal government would accept in uh, the sale of Western land. Long story short, um, well, meanwhile, as all this is going on, Jackson's second term expired. There's a new president. His vice president, Martin Van Buren, won the election. And so Van Buren, who's a Democrat, who was on board with Jackson's bank war plan, is is president. But it, right there, a few months into his first term, Van Buren's first term, a panic hits in May of 1837, began in New York, began New York and then spread throughout the country. And it was attributed, attributable to many different factors, um, over speculation, Western land, uh, the state banks had expanded credit too much especially after receiving the federal deposits. And like I noted, the species circular had led to this increased demand for coin. And so there was a, uh, there have been you know extra withdrawals of coin from the vaults of these fractional reserve banks. Um, there, was, uh, there was some other causes too. The Bank of England just a few months prior had contracted in England and uh, raised interest rates. And, and this um, halted British investment in the United States after 1836 and so it was multivariate but it was a very severe panic quite severe we've seen this cartoon earlier we looked at it last lecture this cartoon was in the context of of 1837 much of the public actually blamed uh jackson's war against the bank um the public can be fickle sometimes uh, and uh and I mean, especially the removal of deposits and so there's sort of a backlash against jackson and the democrats in in light of this of this panic. Um, a lot of historians have also echoed this view, and sometimes you'll hear historians claim that the bank war was a failure because it led to the panic of 1837. I disagree very strongly with that view. I'll give my conclusions of the bank war at the end of this lecture. But um, uh, the, the panic of 1837 was mostly the result of uh, uh, some poor um, policy decisions in the aftermath of the of the closing of the Bank of the United States. 
namely, again, uh, some recklessness with the federal deposits and placing them in the state banks. And there were some other reasons, too, but I don't think you can say that the panic of 1837 was evidence that it was wrong to take down this bank in the United States. I think that those are two entirely different subjects, but that the panic of 1837 was due to other causes, a bit of a mismanagement in the immediate aftermath of taking down the Bank of the United States. As I'll explain at the end of the lecture, I actually think taking down the Bank of the United States ended up being a good thing for the country and that Jackson was ultimately right about this issue. But oftentimes you will hear people point to the Panic of 1837 as evidence of the wrongheadedness of Jackson's decision to take down the bank. And so you'll get all sorts of different opinions. My, my, my opinion um, is, is that the two are, are separate and that the panic was due to mismanagement that did, was unrelated directly to the question of whether or not to take down the Bank of the United States. Well, um, nevertheless, this puts the Democrats in a bad situation and the Whigs seem poised to take back the White House. Martin Van Buren is going to run for re-election. The Whigs decide to play it safe and run a war hero candidate. Um, he was an elderly man by this point, 68 years old, William Henry Harrison, but he was a war hero from back in the, um, some of the Indian Wars in the early 19th century. And uh, uh, William Henry Harrison was not an ideologue. He actually didn't even talk about issues much on a campaign. Um, he boasted about having uh, been born in a log cabin and having a taste for, for hard cider as a way to appeal to the common voter and uh, kind of left the issues ambiguous and uh, won the election because of, uh, uh, because of the um, panic and people uh, blaming the Democrats for the panic. That's a pretty big landslide victory for the Whigs. Now, um, the Whigs wanted to play really, really careful. They, they run this guy, a war hero, who's not going to talk about the issues much. And then for his running mate, they added a Democrat, a man named John Tyler. But John Tyler was a different type of Democrat. He was uh, sort of, you hear about never Trumpers today in the Republican Party. Well, he was a, sort of a never Jacksonian. Um, he was a Democrat who liked Jefferson, but he believed that Jackson, you know, had somewhat of a dictatorial streak about him. And so he opposed Jackson uh, through much of his presidency. John Tyler was from Virginia. And so the Whigs say, ah, eh, vice president, doesn't matter. Let's put him on the ticket in order to, to, to uh, win Virginia, which they actually didn't end up winning. Uh, Van Buren still won Virginia, and they didn't need Virginia in the first place, but that's what they did. Um, it was a purely political move. So uh, 1841, Harrison, uh, Inauguration Day in March. Um, the Whigs control the House of Representatives. The Whigs control the Senate. Henry Clay is uh, the leader in the Senate. William Henry Harrison uh, appoints Daniel Webster to be a Secretary of State, and the understanding is that Clay and Webster will manage things and pretty much run the show. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. You can take a seat, and, and we've got it from here. Unfortunately, uh, for Clay and for Webster, Harrison delivered a lengthy inaugural speech in the rain in March of 1841 and died of a pneumonia a month later, leaving this man to become president of the United States. Clay cannot believe it. <laughs> okay, all right, Ooh, calm down everybody, it's okay. Uh, you know, um, John Tyler, he's not going to obstruct our program. He'll be, he'll be loyal, it's all right. Uh, not our number one choice here, but we'll make do. And so Henry Clay decides to uh, move forward with his agenda. He wants to pass a third Bank of the United States. And boy, seems ready to do it. Um, they pass it through, and this time he calls it the Fiscal Bank. The Fiscal Bank. Sounds a little more professional. The Fiscal Bank. Passes the House, passes the Senate, gets to John Tyler's desk, and Tyler vetoes. Vetoes. Clay cannot believe it. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? We finally get the House. We finally get the Senate. We finally get the, the White House. And then this guy, this guy has to die on me. And now I'm, I'm stuck with a Democrat who I thought would, would maybe at least cooperate a little bit. And he vetoes the bill. Clay tries again. I mean, remember, he's got the House and the Senate. Clay passes a bill through the House. This time they rename it. Still a third bank of the United States, but they give it a different name. Call it the Fiscal Corporation. The Fiscal Corporation. Oh, this sounds a little more benign. 
passes the House, passes the Senate, you guessed it, John Tyler vetoed that bank bill once again. Clay is just tearing out his hair, cannot believe it. The Wake Party formally expelled John Tyler, Tyler from their party. His entire cabinet, with the exception of Daniel Webster, he figured oh, I might as well stay along and try to influence him. His entire cabinet resigned in protest. <laughs> Believe this. The whole cabinet resigned. There was an attempt in the House of Representatives, led by the Whigs, to impeach him. Whigs, Whig newspapers called Tyler, quote, the executive ass. <laughs> Effigies of Tyler in New England were burned in public squares. <laughs> Huge debacle. Clay just cannot believe it. Well, Tyler, needless to say, doesn't get the Whig nomination in 1844. This time, the Whigs say, let's play it safe. Clay says, I've got it. I've got it. Just let's not even risk it this time. I'm going to run. Runs against James K. Polk. This time, by 1844, the economy is recovered. The economy is recovered. And, you know, people really just aren't into the bank issue anymore. It's done. It's over. People are over it. All right. We're, we all have a bank in the United States. Any longer, and, and it's been that way for about a decade now. So it's no longer front and center. Rather, this other issue, Texas and and Mexico, is is on the front burner, and and James K. Polk takes a real easy to understand view on Texas, annex Texas. Polk says Henry Clay waffles a bit, doesn't really take a a stance one way or the other, and uh, uh, Clay loses the election. Clay loses the election. Um, Polk takes it, and uh, and that's that. That's that. Um, there will not be a third bank of the United States. Andrew Jackson, for his part, a lot of people are, are surprised when they hear us. We actually have some photographs of Jackson in his uh, dying in his last years. Jackson retired to the Hermitage in, in 1837, and 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 that's where he lived. Until his death in, in 1845, when he was 78 years old. So he lived a, a nice long life. 1845, he remained highly influential in national politics after he um, after his term was done. Um, just as a side note, he's a big advocate of union, the federal union, and um, rejected uh, any talk because he started to hear it by 1845 of secession. He was a big unionist. In fact, he said, quote, I will die with the union. On his deathbed, uh, he regretted first not hanging Calhoun for treason. If you know that story, that's quite uh, humorous. Uh, but also, apparently, um, he was asked on his deathbed, Mr. President, what was your greatest accomplishment? What was your greatest accomplishment? And Jackson says, and sort of, the, he's 78 years old. He thinks about it for a minute. He says, I killed the bank. I killed the bank. Jackson considered the bank war to be his greatest accomplishment, and uh, and Jackson died in 1845. Well, there he is. Um, wh what a man. Uh, and, of course, Jackson deals in a whole lot of other areas, and um, it's a very uh, uh, rich presidency, a very controversial presidency, a very complicated presidency as well. But um, to show my cards a little bit, if I may, on the bank war, um, I think that was the most triumphant, in my view, the most triumphant moment of Jackson's presidency, because what you had was a triumph of the people, the democracy, um, triumphing against the power of money, corporate interests, and, uh, and an elite oligarchy that thought that they uh, knew better than, than the public. And to me, this was a, a, a victory for the country. And I think if you look at the country between 1836 and 1913, if you look at the economy, as we'll see, we'll look at how the economy was organized in those years and the banking system. And the United States underwent an industrial revolution during that period, built an immensely uh, impressive railroad system, um, became one of the greatest economies in the world, and didn't have a central bank. Um, there are dangers in having a central bank, and Jackson recognized that. And and I think 
at the end of the day, when you look at it, and, and opinions will vary, Jackson was right. Jackson was right, and he was right to take down the Bank of the United States. And again, I think it was good for the country. Um, but over the next couple of lectures, we will take a look at what happens um, in the United States post-Jackson, post-bank war, and, uh, and how the banking system evolved. And we'll go right up, right up to, to 1913 and the founding of the Federal Reserve Act. So looking forward to that. See you next time.